there's a high possibility that terrorist groups will try to approach the Taliban and base themselves there. It's certainly providing inspiration to jihadi groups around the world. It's as though he couldn't adjust to the new situation, or maybe even in his mind, he's still stuck in Vietnam. So he wanted to be the president who brought our boys home. This is a country where, in the end, the state structures are not very strong. It's really can often revert to being 20,000 independent villages. And it has a slightly history of a slightly paranoid relationship to the outside world. So it would take a real Nelson Mandela-like figure amongst the Taliban to really turn that around. Uh, let's uh, take a couple of questions uh, from, from the audience. Uh, by the way, we have hundreds of uh, Indonesians that are tuning in and thank you for tuning in. Let me uh, take one question, or oh, this is actually from Romania, the Romanian Diplomatic Institute. What can we expect from the UK policy-wise for Afghanistan? Well, the, it's all to play for. I think there are two things that the UK should be doing, and it would be wonderful to work with Romania and other countries to do. And they're largely focused on the humanitarian situation, on the refugee situation. So the first thing is we should be continuing humanitarian and development assistance to people inside Afghanistan. If we don't, there will be an enormous pressure of refugees and people trying to leave the country. So that means not imposing sanctions. That means continuing to produce funding for charities and UN agencies. It means getting the banking system going again. It's almost impossible to transfer money to anyone in Afghanistan at the moment. And it's actually within five days of running out of all its money. Its water supply, electricity systems are going to collapse. The engineers aren't there. The consultants aren't there to support all of this. So the first thing is providing humanitarian development assistance and doing so in a smart way, which doesn't get presented as supporting the Taliban government, but is about supporting the Afghan people. The second thing is coming up with a proper humanitarian compact on refugees and sharing the burden across the world. That doesn't mean the United Kingdom or Romania taking the full burden for themselves. It means a genuinely equitable share where we have a pledging conference and we all undertake to take a certain number. I'd like to see people aim to take, let's say, 0.05% of their population every year. Canada has done a fantastic lead, as always. The Canadians are extraordinary on this. have already announced they'll take 25,000 people. Um, the British have announced 20,000, but it's only 5,000 a year for four years. They could take many, many more. There have been incredibly generous offers uh, from North Macedonia, Albania, uh, Kosovo, Serbia have all uh, stepped forward to say that they will take some refugees. I Iraq has also offered. Um, if countries like that can offer, certainly France, Germany, Britain, the US, Australia could be taking far more. And the model, of course, is the Vietnamese boat people in the late 1970s, where eventually the world got together and uh, came up with a compact for two and a half million people. Oh, okay. We have a question from Ade May Rizal. Uh, do you expect Afghanistan to be the victim of a new geopolitical game? Yes, very much. I mean, it, it will be a fragile state. It will be a vacuum. Many other countries, Pakistan, Iran, China, Russia, will be tempted to get involved. There's a high possibility that terrorist groups will try to approach the Taliban and base themselves there. It's certainly providing inspiration to jihadi groups around the world. So it's, um, yeah, I think it, it's going to be the center for a new major geopolitical problem. And yet again, entirely unnecessarily. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, anyone who wants to ask questions, just uh, send some uh, of your uh, questions to the chat. Yeah. Uh, Indra Wisnu Wibisono asks, the, sooner or later, the United States will finish Afghan war, and it has been proven. But the question is, why now? Uh, what happened with the United States? Why they choose to end it now and in a hurry uh, with that manner when they left? Even U.S. allies are starting to question America's decision for damaging their image. So I agree. I agree. It was a very, very difficult, inexplicable decision to understand. I think from President Biden's point of view, so let's try to understand what he was thinking. President Biden was deeply influenced by Vietnam and he was very angry that in 2009, he was not able to prevent 
President Obama from sending more troops to Afghanistan to stop the surge. So I think he wasn't really looking at Afghanistan, the reality of Afghanistan. The reality of Afghanistan beginning of this year, as I said, was only 2,500 American soldiers compared to 25,000 in South Korea. And it was a situation where no American soldiers had been killed since February 2020, and only, I think, about 60 since 2014, right? So, but he didn't see that. President Biden, instead of seeing the reality of this very, very light, relatively cost-free US presence, which was almost infinitely sustainable, convinced himself that he was in the middle of a bloody civil war, that uh, thousands of American lives were being lost, that he was still stuck in the forever wars of 2009. It's as though he couldn't adjust to the new situation, or maybe even in his mind, he's still stuck in Vietnam. So he wanted to be the president who brought our boys home. And to justify this, he tried to say that President Trump had begun a peace negotiation with the Taliban uh, at the end, the beginning of 2020. And in that negotiation, President Trump had said he was going to remove troops. So Biden's argument is, OK, uh, we said we were going to remove troops. We couldn't leave the troops there because we told the Taliban we were going to remove the troops. It's a very, very. So that's his view. It's a crazy view, of course, because that agreement with the Taliban was the US would leave its troops if the Taliban agreed to a ceasefire and uh, to come to a, a government where they would have a compromise with the Afghan government and they would not take any district capitals and this, that and the other. So obviously the Taliban didn't follow through on what their side of the deal was supposed to be, uh, in which case the removal of US troops was crazy. He's also suggesting that if we had tried to leave the troops there, then in the future, we would have been drawn into a horrible war. Well, who knows? But there's definitely no evidence of that at all. As I say, I mean, the US British troops were not under any pressure at all. They hadn't lost a single casualty in a year and a half. So this idea that somehow if we'd stayed, we would be test, uh, we would suddenly find ourselves facing casualties, very difficult to believe. The US-UK presence was in big bases and it was basically just providing support. They were liaison officers sitting alongside Afghan air controllers, uh, providing some support with drones and planes. There was no way that the Taliban was going to be able to get to them. And in fact, the Taliban didn't really have a conventional military option. They simply couldn't roll tanks and artillery up to these towns because if they did, they'd be hit from the air. So fast forward, what did the US do in this withdrawal? What they did is they basically dismantled the linchpin of the Afghan military. So the Afghan military had been built with a very, very expensive US wraparound. Instead of allowing the Afghan army to continue to buy relatively straightforward Russian military equipment, which they were used to and which they'd had for 40 years, they encouraged the US, uh, the, the Afghan Air Force to buy Black Hawk helicopters, these very, very expensive high technology American helicopters. And those helicopters and the other planes and the other assets on the ground required 18,000 American civilian contractors on the ground in Afghanistan to run them. They did all the maintenance, they did all the IT software updates, they actually loaded the munitions onto them. Right? The, these were pieces of equipment that after every mission needed to do a full, incredibly complicated, highly technical software update. They also had systems that were incredibly high tech in terms of surveilling from the air, which required US air controllers sitting alongside Afghan air controllers. These things were essential because if you are an Afghan fighting in an outpost in the middle of some crazy part of Uruzgan or I don't know, Helmand, you need the close air support because that's where your ammunition supplies comes from, that's where your food comes from, that's where your medical evacuation comes from. And the United States removed that overnight. They didn't just remove their own planes and their own air controllers, they removed the 18,000 civilian contractors who maintained the Afghan Air Force. So suddenly these Afghans were out there in these lonely positions with no close air support, no medevac, no food. Many of them hadn't been paid for some time. But most fundamentally, it was the morale blow. Mm. The Americans left like thieves in the night. They left Bagram Air Base without even telling the Afghan commander they were leaving. He just woke up in the morning, they weren't there anymore. Mm. So mm. it's genuinely the morale. We've been totally betrayed, we've been totally left. And then people thought, okay, I'm not gonna do a suicidal fight against the Taliban when nobody has my back, nobody's coming to get me. 
right? I'm out here in this outpost. There's no helicopters coming. There's no air support. We're all going to be murdered. So not surprisingly, uh, in the end, people decided that however much they hate the Taliban, it was preferable to a suicidal and hopeless fight, village after village after they'd been betrayed. Mm. You know, Rory, now there is a, a government in uh, Afghanistan, in Kabul at least, uh, and there have been some pledges of allegiance by some ethnic groups and so on towards the uh, Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan under the Taliban. Yeah. Mm. Yes. How sustainable is this uh, coalition? Is this new political setup uh, in, in Kabul? Very difficult to know. I mean, uh, the, the fact is the Taliban are a very small organization, very, very thinly spread. They took the country much more quickly than they could ever have imagined. They were only able to do so by releasing prisoners from jail and using prisoners to help them take these towns. They have no experience in governing or running anything. Most of the middle-class civil servants are not coming to work. It's going to be very difficult. When I walked across Afghanistan, end of 2001, after five years of Taliban government, there was basically no government services. There were no schools in rural areas, really. There were very few clinics. There were very few roads. There was no, I mean, and when you went to see the Taliban in their office, they were guys kind of sitting around having cups of tea, but the offices were largely empty. I mean, nothing was happening. There was no money to run the state. So it's very difficult to know whether they're going to be able to run a state at all. And mm -hmm. Afghanistan and military control in Afghanistan is so fragile because the Taliban have just, in 1995, they did what they've just done now. They took the whole country in a matter of weeks with basically with almost no fighting. People just laid down their arms and they bought their way from time to time. But after 9-11, the end of 2001, they lost the country in about two weeks as well. Because as soon as a little bit of pressure from the Northern Alliance backed by very, very few Americans came on them, the Taliban government just vanished. So this is a country where in the end, the state structures are not very strong. It's really can often revert to being 20,000 independent villages. And the state hasn't penetrated very deeply into these areas. So the Taliban government will be a very fragile government. And, and it's still very ethnically connected with the Pashtun group in southern Afghanistan, southern and eastern Afghanistan. It doesn't have strong support from the Hazara, from the Tajik, from the Uzbek. Yeah. Rory, some of the Taliban leaders have said that, yeah, we'll forgive uh, everybody as long as we live in uh, Sharia law, Islamic state, right? Yeah. And, you know, there, there are quite a few Islamic states around the world that also implements uh, Sharia law, sure. and they have some degree of freedom, uh, modernity, yeah. modernity, sure. and economic growth. Yeah, sure. is 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 it realistic to say that the Afghan under uh, the Taliban will head one way, uh, one form or another in that direction? It's very difficult to know. We we don't know, and I think in a sense the. Indonesian audience here in this conversation has a better sense than people do in Britain or the United States about the costs, benefits, and risks of this. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's true that there are examples of um, Muslim governments around the world implementing Sharia who are running states which have economic growth, which have state stability, and which are delivering many things for their citizens. Of course, that's true. We can think of many examples. Mm -hmm. But the Taliban is quite far out. I mean, it's quite an extreme group. This is not a, you know, remember, even under the last government they were fighting against, it was a Muslim country, which actually implemented a lot of elements of traditional Muslim social codes. Mm -hmm. So under President Karzai, for example, a judge found uh, that somebody who had converted from Islam should be sentenced to death. So this was not a very, um, Afghanistan was not uh, Dubai, right? It was mm -hmm. not a very kind of trendy, super fashionable place, right? It was a place where Afghans are still quite conservative. I mean, even under the last government, President Ghani's government, women covered their heads. People were modestly dressed. Mm -hmm. This was not a sort of crazy party capital, not like, um, mm -hmm. so it's, it wasn't like Egypt or, 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 
you know, Lebanon, right? Um, so we, we don't know what the Taliban are going to do, but my guess is that it will probably be a government which will be more conservative than the Muslim government, Brotherhood government that emerged in, in Egypt under Morsi. Mm. It will probably have less technical and technocratic skills. And it has a slightly history of a slightly paranoid relationship to the outside world. So it would take a real Nelson Mandela-like figure amongst the Taliban to really turn that around and actually yeah. embrace it. And I think it's unlikely. Yes. Yeah. I don't see any such figure around uh, from from uh, what I see.